the Reverend Rhett Dodson and Teresa, his dear bride. Uh, they, Rhett has indeed been one of my life's great encouragements, and uh, I wish I resembled those remarks uh, that he so kindly attributed to me. Uh, he has been a source of wisdom and encouragement to me, and I'm honored to be today at his church, and I'm thankful for the invitation uh, to speak to you today. I'm also so grateful for Rhett's sister, Carolyn, and, uh, and uh, Rhett's brother-in-law, uh, Ron, who are pillars of Second Presbyterian Church in Greenville, where I'm from. Uh, what a delight uh, to reconnect as well. I look forward to reconnecting uh, with the Reverend Justin Salinas and his wife, Nikki. Uh, Justin's father was a good friend of mine back home and uh, was a big encouragement to me in ministry. It's fun to watch Justin grow up and now serve here in this church here in Hudson. As a boy growing up in Greenville, South Carolina, in the summers, I would listen to an AM radio station out of Cleveland. Uh, I enjoyed listening to the broadcast of the Cleveland Symphony Orchestra from Severance Hall and uh, just found it amazing to connect with a place a world away and uh, to sort of discover a world outside of my own little home. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be here with you today and to talk with you. I want to introduce you uh, to, to some of you. Most of you will know, but I want to introduce to you your family history. I want to tell your church history origins uh, and connect it to, to here in Grace in Hudson. Uh, I want to connect your local church to its denominational history and to the Reformed tradition. I'll also do so by tracing the idea of Christianity through the English-speaking peoples of the old world uh, to the new here in Northeast Ohio. Uh, our title then is Christianity and the English-speaking peoples in the Connecticut Western Reserve of Ohio, and we'll get to all of those meanings here shortly. We tend to associate uh, the arrival of Christianity in the uh, English-speaking parts of the world with Augustine in 597 AD in Britain. But there are traces of Christianity in Great Britain as far back as the first century of Roman occupation. When Rome leaves Britain, it looked as if paganism might again take over uh, the, and get the better of Christianity when after the departure of Romans, new invaders arrived, Angles and Saxons and Jutes, yet somehow Christianity survived on the western edges of Britain. Even during the Dark Ages, missionary activity continued in Wales and Ireland, and in western Scotland, a man named Columba helped bring a distinctly Celtic band of Christianity to mainland Britain. The Latinus stone pictured here was discovered in 1891 during the clearances on the site. It appeared to have been reused in a later medieval church. It was probably a Christian memorial and later a part of an early Christian cemetery. I once saw this stone with my brother Ligon in the 1980s near Whithorn, an early Christian part of Scotland. It may be the oldest relic of Christianity in Britain. It reads in Latin, we praise you, Lord, Latinus, aged 35, and his daughter, aged four. The grandson of Beravada set up this memorial. The name Latinus would indicate the man had ties to Roman Britain. His name associates with the Roman Empire rather than that of a Celtic tribe. He is said to be the grandson of Beravadas, which seemed to be a Celtic or a pagan name. This stone is a living connection to over 1,500 years of Christian witness in Scotland and as an example of Christianity's ancientry amongst the English-speaking peoples. We shift into Iona. For almost 700 years, the Isle of Iona, which lay within the Gallic kingdom of Dalriada, was the center of Celtic Christianity within Great Britain. Missionaries from this little island off the west coast of Scotland would take the gospel as far as the Volga River in Russia and south into Germany and into the continent of England or of Europe. Iona became the renowned center of learning and its scriptorium produced highly important documents including probably the first draft of the book of Kells. Some of you may have seen that famous book, an illustrated version of the gospels. 
Near this old church is an ancient burial ground where kings from Scotland, Ireland, Norway, and France are buried. Iona is an example of the way in which Celtic Christianity was a bridge between the early expressions of Christianity and later more faithful expressions of Christianity that emerges within Britain. Those of you who may be familiar with the book How the Irish Saved Civilization will know that the thesis of it is that places like Iona kept the historical knowledge of the ancient Christian world alive through writing of scriptures and ancient Christian books. This uh, resource would later emerge later in the Middle Ages and cause the Western world to flourish. Uh, I believe this thesis is true and Iona is an example of that. Uh, if you ever go to Scotland and you're able, it's, a, it's an arduous journey to make it to Iona, but it's well worth a visit. We then go from Iona to the Reformation. Now, Grace Presbyterian Church is in the Protestant tradition. As we think about our history as a church, we need, of course, to reference Martin Luther and the Reformation. This is the 50th anniversary of the PCA. We're 500 years into the Reformation of the church. Luther was ordained into the priesthood in 1507. He came to reject several teachings and practices of the Roman church. In particular, he disputed the view on indulgences. He proposed an academic discussion of the practice and efficacy of indulgences, amongst other things, in his 95 Theses of 1517. Luther taught that salvation and consequently eternal life are not earned by good deeds, but are received as a free gift of God's grace through the believer's faith in Jesus Christ as redeemer from sin. His theology challenged the authority of, and the office of the Pope by teaching that the Bible alone was the only source of divinely revealed knowledge. His refusal to renounce all of his writings of the demand of Pope Leo X in 1520 and the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V at the Diet of Worms in 1521 resulted in his excommunication and the Pope condemned him as an outlaw as well as the Holy Roman Emperor. It was 1521 and Luther was being summoned to testify before the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. The examiner asked Martin Luther, will you retract your views of the Christian faith? And Luther famously replied, If I am not convinced by proof from Holy Scripture or by cogent reasons, and if my judgment is not in this way brought into subjection to God's word, I neither can nor retract anything, for it cannot be either safe or honest for a Christian to speak against his conscience. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. The consequences of Luther's testimony begot a Reformation which changed all of Western Europe. This map shows some of Protestantism's influence within the continent. The different colors represent the expressions of Reformation Christianity. Beginning in the northern Europe in the early 16th century, the Reformation spread, often supplanting the, Reformed Catholic, uh, the, the Roman Catholic Church. Protestantism would look a little different in different places. You see here in the blue uh, the Anglicans of, of England. You see the Swiss and the French uh, in, in purple color. And then you see uh, the, the Catholic green on the map here. The Lutheran uh, pink shows the influence of German Lutheranism in the Nordic countries. Uh, the word Protestant was first used by German princes and free cities at the Diet of Speer when they were speaking against the Reformation. Like a lot of great insults uh, become, the word Protestant became an insult that was turned into an, an affirmation of a good idea, that is, that Christians should protest and reform the church. From Luther we go to John Knox, the founder of the Church of Scotland, a Scottish minister, a theologian, and writer who is a leader of the country's Reformation. He is the founder of the Presbyterian Church, known as the Church of Scotland. He is believed to have been educated at the University of St. Andrews, 
a place which may be windier than Northeast Ohio, <clears throat> though maybe not. He worked as a priest. Uh, his earliest job was to carry a sword at outdoor revival meetings so that the minister he was chosen to guard would not be killed by the populace. He joined the movement uh, through George Wishart to reform the Church of Scotland. While in exile, uh, he was licensed to work for the Church of England, where he rose in ranks to serve the young King Edward VI. As a royal chaplain, he exerted a reforming influence on the text of the early version uh, of the, of the uh, English Articles of Faith, as well as the Book of Common Prayer. When Mary Tudor ascended the throne of England and reestablished Roman Catholicism, Knox fled to the continent where he was tutored uh, by John Calvin. In, in Geneva, uh, he, he learnt uh, Reformed theology and Presbyterian polity. On his return to Scotland, Knox led the Protestant Reformation. He was invited by the lords of the congregation to help write a new confession and establish a new ecclesiastical order for the newly created Reformed Church known in Scotland as the Kirk. About a hundred years after Knox's impact in Scotland, the Reformation had settled somewhat in Britain, and in the context of the English Civil Wars, the English Parliament called together a assembly of divines, and that's just an old-fashioned word for scholar ministers. They were invited to come to London to participate in a theological endeavor to write a document which would become the theological unifying document for both England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. The assembly was made up of 30 laymen, 20 from the House of Commons, 10 from the House of Lords, 121 English clergymen, and famously a delegation of Scottish Presbyterian ministers who were not allowed to vote, but they were given the privilege of the floor, and they exerted tremendous influence on the deliberation which formed our theological document that we use even today here at Grace Church, the Westminster Standards. From July of 1643 until February of 1649, it held over a thousand meetings within Westminster Abbey for which its work was named. It continued to meet for a few years thereafter. The works produced what were generally accepted by Presbyterian and Reformed folks as the standard of interpreting the Bible the best throughout the English-speaking worlds. <clears throat> now, while the Reformation was beginning to take hold in Britain, the nation pursued a national strategy of colonization. And the, the English monarch uh, chose to do this by settling the plantation of Ulster, a province of Ireland, with, or this settlement was largely in Northern Ireland, by moving key people groups within Great Britain uh, to Ireland. Most of the land was forfeited by Nalic, uh, native Gaelic-speaking chiefs, many of whom had fled Ireland uh, for mainland Europe following a war against English rule. The official plantation comprised an, an estimated half a million acres. The new colony attracted settlers who were largely Presbyterian in type. Many came from the lowlands of Scotland and the north of England. Uh, there have been so many cross migrations back and forth between Northern Ireland and southwestern Scotland that it's almost a unique people group uh, within Britain. But nevertheless, this settlement had, a, had a, an important impact on the future settlement of America by Protestant Northern Irish uh, immigrants. Now, this next slide is taken from a, one of my favorite his, historical works, and it, it's a work which describes the, the settlement of English-speaking peoples in the New World. A hundred years or so after the settlement of the Ulster plantations, there was a, a movement of those folks to America. Now, this occurred along with other people migration movements. There were four of them, basically. Anglicans, uh, who tended to uh, come from London and the southeast of England, famously settled the Virginia Tidewater, the Carolina Low Country. You tend to think of them as, as uh, kind of um, cavalier Southerners, you might even say. Uh, th there was a pilgrim migration, we would all know, that, that impacted the, the founding, foundation of, of New England. 
This tended to come from East English uh, and East Anglia folk. These were pilgrim folks who settled uh, in New England. Uh, there was a large nonconformist migration to the Middle Atlantic colonies. You think about Pennsylvania and the Quakers. This particular group is hugely important in the settlement of Ohio and the Midwest. And then there, the largest of these four groups were what in America we call the Scots-Irish, and in, in Britain they're sometimes called Ulster Scots. Uh, about a quarter of a million Scots-Irish folk immigrated in the 18th century from the plantations of Ulster to the new colonies of America, and they went to the four great cities of North America at that time, Boston, New York, um, Philadelphia and Charleston. The largest port they went to was Philadelphia. And uh, Scots-Irish Americans uh, are uh, descendant uh, of this people group in large numbers. Millions of Americans with European ancestors identify as Scots-Irish. Some have said this is the first immigrant group to America that thought of themselves not as where they came from, but who they were now as Americans. So oftentimes, even in the early days of America, Scots-Irish folk would consider themselves ethnically as American, which is important to our story. Now, I tried to find a map to show this in, in uh, an American context, and I look at this now and go, this map is crazy. Um, but you can sort of see the, the yellow gold color is sort of the, uh, the, the cavalier southerners, as I've called them. The purple and red are actually the Scots-Irish, and you see there's both a Midwestern and an upland and inland southern component to that. The blue are the nonconformists and the, and the Quakers. And then at the very north uh, east, you'll see the, the Puritan Pilgrim Fathers there. So with that as something of a, of a cultural description of, of uh, English-speaking peoples, let's jump into Presbyterianism in particular. You had three early expressions of the Presbyterian Church in the main regions of the colonies. Uh, there was the Jamaica Church on Long Island uh, that dates back to 1640. There's a Presbyterian Church on Edisto Island in South Carolina in the 1680s. And then Philadelphia, with the, with the large numbers of Scots-Irish, becomes a major center of Presbyterianism with the church founded as early as 1698. The father of American Presbyterianism is a man named Francis McKimmy. Now, he's another Irishman with connections to America. He was invited uh, by uh, folks who lived in Virginia and Maryland to come plant a church in the New World. And McKimmy uh, was known as a Christian gentleman, an enterprising man of affairs, a public-spirited citizen. His advocacy for religious freedom allowed the gospel, and particularly the Reformed faith, to flourish in the mid-Atlantic colonies. And uh, uh, under his influence, uh, the Presbyterian Church would establish uh, the first presbytery in the United States uh, at Philadelphia in 1706. Uh, some of you may know the joke that a, an independent Presbyterian is, oxymoronic, is as oxymoronic as a cooperative Baptist. Um, <laughs> presbyterians don't do things alone we do things with one another we do things in presbyteries we cooperate uh, we are interconnected and what was your other phrase interdependent and uh, and, and McKimmy planted that this notion this presbyterian idea that presbyterians need to cooperate in ministry so he leads a group of men to establish a presbytery in 1706 in Philadelphia. Uh, it was made up of men uh, from English and Welsh backgrounds, along with some Yale graduates, and they form a presbytery in 1706. Now, about 15, 12 or so years later, a synod is formed. A synod uh, is not a denomination, but it's more than a presbytery. It's a, it's a large region of presbyteries. And again, in Philadelphia, a group of uh, four uh, different presbyteries form a synod so that uh, this connectedness, this interdependence can extend beyond a region to a larger region. And then after the American Revolution, a denomination is formed, again in Philadelphia in 1789. Uh, there, by this time, there were 16 presbyteries, 
and there were three or four synods, and they convened under the leadership of John Witherspoon uh, and, and helped write the Book of Church Order and established a national Presbyterian church. The, the General Assembly met in the same city at the, roughly at the same time that the Constitution was being written and began the great uh, process of organizing national Presbyterianism. Now, uh, from Philadelphia, let me go back again a little bit to the story of migration. Uh, there was uh, what came to be known in the south and the eastern United States as the Great Wagon Road. There was a road to the wilderness that came out of Philadelphia. It went to Lancaster, uh, PA, and then it went uh, down the Appalachian Trail. The Great Wagon Road was the primary route of Presbyterian settlement in Virginia backcountry and in the, the Piedmont region of the Carolinas. And this Scots-Irish immigrant group uh, tended to be restless, clannish, and fiercely independent. It forms the Appalachian culture, and the Great Wagon Road passed south all the way uh, to the Carolinas. Now, the Ohio version of this, the migration pattern, comes through uh, what is known as the Western Reserve of Ohio. So uh, after the American Revolution, uh, Connecticut claims a portion of land, which is now northern Ohio, is a part of their colony. And uh, they uh, give up the rights to Ohio as part of a settlement with the new American Congress. Uh, but a reserve had been granted to the colony as far back as the reign of King Charles II, and Connecticut exercises a tremendous amount of influence on the founding of Northeast Ohio. Many of the early uh, entrepreneurs and speculators were New England folk, and even within the Christian, and, and particularly within the Presbyterian tradition, Connecticut ministers were unique in bringing Presbyterianism and the Reformed faith to Northeast Ohio. Uh, Connecticut would relinquish some of its uh, claims to the western lands, uh, but this settlement, this portion of Northeast Ohio, retained the name the Western Reserve because of this historic connection. Connecticut retained ownership of this portion of this session south of Lake Erie, and it came to be known as the Western Reserve. Now, let's go big picture. Um, here is a, uh, a slide which kind of does the three big centuries of American history. Uh, in the 18th century, the biggest challenge for the spread of the, of the faith, the Presbyterian expression of the faith, was the need for theological education. Now, we have a president of a, of a theological seminary with us today. We didn't have that in the 1700s in America. There literally was no pipeline to get qualified, ordained ministers. And so the need for theological education was the issue entry. The impact of the Great Awakening, surprisingly, uh, that created tension in some Presbyterian churches. And then the whole business of structure and organization and church discipline uh, was a massive issue uh, within the history of the Presbyterian church in the 18th century. Uh, there were divisions in both the 18th, the 19th, and the 20th century that related to sort of the tension between order and ardor that always was a part of Presbyterian belief. Uh, in the 19th century, there was an attempt to uh, combine the Puritan New England congregational churches with uh, Presbyterian uh, churches, and uh, this led to theological tension. Uh, the old school, new school division is a theological crisis that's a generation before the Civil War, but it, in its roots, it, it, it's, a, it's a discussion, it's a debate over the authority of the Bible. Uh, the American Civil War caused uh, uh, the greatest tension in the 19th century when the northern and southern churches divided. And then in the 20th century, you have uh, the advent of the fundamentalist and modernist controversies, the reunion of the northern and southern mainline churches. All of this feeds into the birth of the PCA some years later. So let me, let me try to get into this very quickly. In the 20th century, there was a, a series of theological controversies resulting in uh, a, a denial of, of classic Christian truth 
by churches throughout the, the North, particularly in America, culminating in a man named J. Gresham Machen, uh, who is the father of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, uh, leading something of a, of a, um, of a, of a Protestant response uh, to Northern liberalism. In 1923, 100 years ago, he writes a famous book, Christianity and Liberalism, the thesis of which is that liberalism, and we're talking theologically here, is a different religion than Christianity. Uh, he is a professor at Princeton. He reorganizes, uh, you might say, Princeton into Westminster Theological Seminary, uh, an institution founded in 1929, from which many of our Reformed institutions today consider as sort of the headwaters of our own movement. Uh, he begins the cre he creates the Independent Board of Presbyterian Foreign Missions. He's the primary leader of the or of creating the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. He's a stalwart for gospel belief and conservative theological views of the Reformed faith, and is considered in many ways uh, a stalwart of Christianity within Northern Christianity. Uh, in the South, there was a similar kind of theological debate, though it tended to be around issues like evolution and the social gospel and neo-orthodoxy. Uh, some of you may know the, the famous trial that Inherit the Wind uh, was, was uh, built upon. Uh, evolution was a, was a crisis in a lot of Southern uh, institutions in a way that it wasn't in the North. Uh, the social gospel and neo-orthodoxy became uh, the basis for a number of high-profile church discipline cases in the old Southern Presbyterian Church. And this resulted in conservatives realizing that the do denomination, if it wasn't lost, it was becoming lost. And there were high-profile controversies within uh, the church. This controversy, primarily within the Southern Presbyterian Church, led to the foundation of a number of different uh, organizations. Um, how many of you have ever read World Magazine? So World Magazine begins as the Presbyterian Journal. It was originally called the Southern Presbyterian Journal. It was begun by Billy Graham's father-in-law, who was a medical missionary to China. And he came home from China, and he saw the liberalism within the Presbyterian Church. And so he started a magazine to, tr to try to promote a biblical understanding uh, uh, for Presbyterians. And that magazine became the focus of concern and information for conservatives within the old Southern Church. Uh, the Presbyterian Evangelistic Fellowship was an attempt to start a missionary uh, society uh, to send conservative missionaries to the mission field because the denominational missionaries were not sound theologically. Uh, there was a group of uh, laymen uh, that was formed uh, called Concerned Presbyterians in the 1960s, and this was an organization for folks who were members of local churches to become active and involved in discussions about what's going on in the church. And then a fourth group, Presbyterian Churchmen United was a networking and fraternal group amongst uh, ministers and church officers. And these four groups began talking to one another in the 1960s. And the main uh, topic of discussion then was, a, was an effort to unite the old northern and southern mainline. And it was perceived by conservatives uh, as something that would be detrimental to the gospel because of the theological tendencies of both denominations being affirmed in this union. And so these groups worked together. They defeated an early attempt at merger uh, in the 1950s. But by the 1960s, it became clear to conservatives within all of these groups uh, that their efforts to try to preserve and reform the old church uh, was failing. And so they began meeting formally together uh, there used to be a thing in Weaverville, North Carolina called Journal Days where uh, thousands of people would gather uh, in this little town and it would be conservatives in the old PCUS and they would meet and pray and sing and talk about the need to try to reform the old church. Uh, Paul Settle says that by 1971 there were three kinds of people who would come to these meetings. There were Sooners 
and those were people who were ready to, uh, to, to leave. There were keepers, those were people who didn't want to leave. And then there were planners, those were people who, who were ready to leave but wanted to plan more before we left. And, and those three groups kind of represented the three approaches to what was wrong in the church. Finally, by 1973, uh, the different parties came together and, and recognized that there was just an overwhelming need. There was, a, there was such a pronounced uh, liberalism within the church that a new denomination needed to be formed. And so in December of 1973 at Briarwood Presbyterian Church, one of our historic larger congregations in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, the, the PCA was born. Originally, it was known as the National Presbyterian Church. Uh, like a lot of new endeavors, it was so broke financially uh, that when an institution that was called National Presbyterian Church threatened to sue us, uh, we said, well, we'll just change the name because we don't want to get involved in a lawsuit. And so our name became the Presbyterian Church in America. Uh, from our beginning, we've had this, this unofficial official uh, expression of what we are, and, and it's this, that we're, we're faithful to the Scriptures. We believe in the inerrancy of God's Word. We're true to the Reformed faith. We're a product of the English-speaking Reformed tradition, particularly and best expressed by the Westminster Standards. And we're obedient to the Great Commission. We're an evangelical denomination. We're passionate about missions and evangelism. Uh, I might add that one of the big... Uh, uh, institutions which helped the PCA form was Ligon Seminary, RTS. Uh, RTS in the 1960s began and began sending conservative ministers into the old church, and those ministers were really the foot soldiers in many cases of a new denomination. The PCA is reformed in theology and Presbyterian in government. It's characterized by a blend of Calvinistic practice and broad evangelical belief. We have about 2,000 congregations. We have about 400,000 members. We have about 5,000 ministers. And I believe the last, last time I checked, there were 88 presbyteries across North America. Uh, some years ago, the Gospel Coalition wrote an interesting little article on comparing the PCA, the new conservative denomination, with the old denomination, the Peace USA, and I thought this would be interesting to mention to you today. With regard to ordination, the Peace USA allows for the ordination of both men and women, including non celibate homosexuals. In the PCA, only ordained men in obedience to the New Testament standard for those who rule the church and teach, teach doctrine are ordained. With regard to inerrancy, the Peace USA does not teach the scripture is inerrant. The PCA does teach this. With regard to church property, the PCUSA believes that the denomination owns the property. In the PCA, the church property belongs to the local congregation forever and ever. Amen. With regard to abortion, the PCUSA teaches that it's morally acceptable and it ought to be an option. With regard to abortion within the PCA, uh, it, we teach that abortion is wrong. Uh, and that abortion terminates the life of an individual, a bearer image, bearer image of God. With regard to divorce, the Peace USA uh, believes uh, in no-fault divorce. The PCA teaches that divorce is a sin except in cases of adultery or desertion. Uh, with regard to homosexuality, the Peace USA expresses uh, that they believe that it is an acceptable practice. The PCA teaches that homosexual practice is a sin. Well, this is uh, an overview of where we've come from. Uh, it, it ends with Grace Church Hudson. Uh, you are the product of many different expressions of the Christian tradition over many years. You're the product of a lot of faithful ministry that happened within the context of the ordinary migration of people groups. You're the product of the Reformed tradition being taught faithfully, defended, and uh, propagated into all parts of the world. Uh, you're a part of the PCA, which uh, we still believe is the best expression of gospel ministry, truth, and practice uh, within, the, within a lot of good choices 
uh, of the Reformed world. Uh, Grace Presbyterian Church is a part of the PCA's living history, and the, the work of Grace Presbyterian Church is the work of the PCA, and there is much left to do. Are there any comments or questions that I could take from you? Thank you. Yes, sir, the professor. I think we understand it as the Reformed faith as expressed by the Westminster Standards. I think office bearers attribute that as being the best expression of biblical Christianity. So in one sense, I would say it's beyond the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. I think all Christians recognize those great creeds of the church as an Ebenezer stone of, of faithful expression of the early church. I think the Westminster Confession is the product of 1,500 years of Christian and theological perspective and is an attempt to systematize the Bible's teaching in a thorough way. We say one of the creeds every Sunday in our church back home in Greenville, and I think we have a great unity with Christians around the world through those creeds. I think the Presbyterian Church has chosen for, not for its membership, but for its officers to uphold Westminster as a higher expression of biblical understanding. You know, the standard for membership in the PCA is simply a credible profession of faith, but the standards to being an officer is that you have to uphold the Westminster uh, standard. Yes, ma'am. That's very good. Any other questions or comments? Yes, sir, in the back. Ligon? The people that coined the term neo-orthodoxy 
read scripture, and I imagine he may do it today, he will oftentimes make a statement affirming inerrancy in, in a pastoral way, uh, something to the effect of this is the word of God. I was about to go there. If you go, if you go to a Peace USA church, if they read the Bible, you may hear them say, listen for the word of God, and that's kind of a, a mystical way of saying it's in there somewhere. But just because you read it doesn't mean it's the Word of God. And that might be a simplistic way of demonstrating it, but it really is a view of the Bible. I, other than Bart Ligon, who else do you... I mean, you can think of Bart as the main proponent of this, but who else would be in there? Well, again, Emil Bruner and Carl Bart were, were the two prime uh, uh, sort of creative thinkers behind the Orthodoxy, but many Whatever Red asked me to do, I do. <laughs> yes, sir. Amen. So this, this uh, today has been recorded, and you can go uh, to the links on our website. Uh, this will be on our YouTube channel, Facebook, Sermon Audio. Uh, so there will be a public record of this, and you can and share this with folks who were able to be here today. Mel, well, thank you so thank much. You. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Lord, keep us faithful going forward. We confess that we are not the perfect church in America. We are far from it. But we love you, and we ask that you will continue to reform us, that we might adhere as closely to Scripture as it is possible to adhere, that we might be as holy as it's possible for saved sinners to be. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.